On June 30th, 1908, a 12 megaton explosion flattened 80 million trees over a sparsely populated forest region in eastern Russia, an area covering 830 square miles, the largest impact event in recorded history. At that time, there were no man-made explosive technologies capable of producing a blast this size. So, astronomical causes such as a giant meteor were considered. People living in the area observed bluish light, bright as the sun, moving across the sky for ten minutes in a cloudless sky. Then there was a brilliant flash, a scorching hot wind, fire, and thunderous sounds like artillery and a shockwave that knocked people off their feet. For the next few evenings, the night sky in Asia and Europe was aglow. Photographs were taken in Sweden and Scotland at midnight without flashbulbs, 2,400 miles away from the epicenter, a distance comparable to the span between the east and west coasts of the United States. In brief, the effect of the Tunguska event was massive and that has puzzled the scientific community ever since. Current theories include it was caused by a meteor, though curiously, no meteoric mass has ever been found embedded in the ground. Another theory says the meteor exploded in the atmosphere, and yet there are other theories claiming only antimatter could have caused an explosion this big without leaving a trace. And possibly an ET craft was involved. To investigate this further, a team remote viewing project was set up. Hi, my name is Don DeCursell and I'll be reviewing and commenting on the two remote viewing sessions I did for this project. Both sessions were done in the TDS remote viewing format, and there were two different target cues, one for each session. And that's because I aborted the first session early, for reasons I'll explain later on. For the record, this review is being done after target feedback was provided, so now I can list the target cue here and include relevant comments as we move along. Let's get started with the first session. This is the header page. In the TDS format, you begin with a full-page scribble called the transit line. The basic idea is to make initial nervous system contact with the target by scribbling randomly on the paper. But this scribble often contains visual information. For example, this one. It reminds me of a person looking at and perhaps pointing to something far away, having a long trail and ending or starting with something like a ball. All of that was drawn in less than a second. Getting into the next page, I got perceptions of something long, hand clenching, bright lighting, and fast movements up and down, falling, and there was a dangerous aspect to it. It was elevated and could be categorized as a sharp jolt, traveling up to some sort of ledge or plateau of some kind. There was an aerodynamic aspect and a descent involved. On the next page, I was getting information about a motion path. It had an easy-going initial involvement and a preparatory stage that led to a sharp change, a directed movement toward a certain location, and again with an initial relaxed approach. It reached the starting point on a fairly straight or level course, followed by that sharp change, a change in both feeling and involvement. A sense of movement along the path, and there was a circling movement or a circling aspect. It's going around. I feel it's getting closer. Then 
moving in front of me and then away. Then a bunch of AOLs. Again, some of these seem to give hints. For example, climbing a mountain and backpacks, rough terrain, convey a sense of moving through rough mountainous territory, which is where the Tunguska event occurred. This notion of something approaching and then moving away links to the theory that something glanced off the Earth's atmosphere, first approaching it, then bouncing off and away, without actually impacting the Earth. The Tunguska event destroyed a large area of forest terrain, but researchers never found any meteoric mass embedded in the Earth at the so-called impact site. On the third page, I continued to get a sense of circular motion and it going around and back, perhaps a tumbling motion. It confronted something, and I got a sense it was leaping over or going over whatever that was. Then it continued at some new height or level. The AOLs on this page conveyed a sense of reaching a conclusion or finish line and something going around and jumping up to a new level. This again, they may be tying in with the asteroid glancing off the atmosphere theory, coming down, hitting the atmosphere, and then jumping to new levels. On the matrix page, I got more or less repetitions of the same information, but there were some curious AOLs here. For example, after sensing this thing was orbiting, I got the AOL of lensing, which is an unusual word, something I don't normally say. Perceptions like these can often be highly accurate, and it was perhaps lensing a large crowd of people or an audience, and there was an element of a rangefinder involved. Rangefinder is another unusual word. And maybe there was some sort of propulsion involved here. All of these things seem to tie in with the theory that the Tunguska event was not caused by a meteor or asteroid, but rather by some sort of mass floating under intelligent control. The fact that the massive explosion occurred in one of the least populated areas of the continent may not be accidental. If this thing were under intelligent control, then they may have been lensing or looking at where large crowds of people were, choosing a location of sparse population, and igniting their escape propulsion at some precise distance from the planet using something like a rangefinder. All of this is purely hypothetical, of course, but you have to understand in remote viewing, if you don't have the proper terminology to describe accurately, the perceptions will paint a fuzzy picture. And it was at this point I aborted the session, early in fact, because I started feeling dizzy. I described this to the project manager as feeling flustered with my temperature elevated, and it scared me. I'm relatively new to experiencing physical manifestations from a remote target site, like the extreme heat that occurred at the Tunguska event. People who witnessed the events reported a heat flash so strong that it caused someone's shirt to catch fire, and it knocked down trees for miles. My overheated reaction was completely unexpected, and I didn't know how to deal with it. So, I stopped. Actually, I thought I caught COVID virus, to be honest. But 20 minutes after I quit, I was completely back to normal. How interesting. But there was one curious thing in my summary that might be of importance. I sensed someone wearing a white, skin-tight jumpsuit. Now, others have reported the Tunguska event was not caused by an asteroid, but by something more like a spacecraft. And this leads me to wonder if my white jumpsuit was just 
a fuzzy perception of a white ET. We'll come back to this idea in a bit. So because I and several others experienced uncomfortable physical manifestations, the project manager issued a second target queue, shown here. And we did a second session. The intent of this queue was to get around anything that was limiting our success in the first round. My transit line scribble looks a bit wild. If anything, it looks like something coming down, swooping down, bouncing off a large landmass and flying away. Though it does have a curious similarity to this satellite map of the region. I got a sense of multiple subjects this time that were friendly. And again, the sun or bright light. And these subjects were wearing sunglasses. Now, now, curiously, the AOL I got right after sunglasses was a facial covering like a white towel covering the face. If you link this notion with the idea of wearing dark sunglasses, wearing a white skin-tight jumpsuit, this might be a naive description for a white ET with those dark eye lenses. I think about these things. These beings were traveling in a group on a journey that involved multiple stages. Their traveling was far too near in a meandering, methodical way. The journey apparently involved some sort of upward movement or high point, which was a goal. I got a sense they were traveling in preparation to cross some sort of threshold. Some of the other remote viewers in this project picked up traveling through a dimensional wormhole. Interesting. I got the AOL prisoners at this point, which was so unusual I looked it up. It can mean incarcerated, but it can also mean confined. Getting back to the ET theory again, if this did involve a spacecraft of some sort, the occupants would indeed be confined. I'm not sure how to interpret the next few perceptions, but I thought intercepting the megalith was curious. A megalith is a large stone that forms a prehistoric monument. And a monument is an outstanding, enduring example of something. These are definitions. Skipping over these repetitions, I now was surprised by this. A dark shadow that was intelligent, man-made, and trespassing allowed. That's an odd way of saying you can enter inside it. This was followed by a monument that's fake. Now, I wonder if this is describing the asteroid-slash-spaceship as sort of like a monument, like a piece of space rock, which would be an enduring example of our primordial galaxy, for example, but augmented with man-made intelligence so it was controllable. A piece of space rock that's fake. This theory is further supported in my matrix session under the concepts column, where I wrote having the right equipment and staying together so let's summarize. What are my remote viewing sessions telling us? Let's start with were my perceptions talking about the Tunguska event? I think the answer to that would be a qualified yes. My first one talked about a circling movement, bright lighting, aerodynamics, falling, a dangerous aspect, a descent, and a sharp jolt. These and the other perceptions seem to discuss what we already know about Tunguska from historical sources and from the people who witnessed it on the ground in 1908. 
Even my transit line sketch seems to convey the notion of a person looking at something falling from the sky. I thought that was particularly interesting. But the second session talked about things we don't seem to know. It discussed multiple subjects, traveling in a group, on a journey, far too near, which was a goal. These subjects crossed some sort of threshold that gave them a magnificent view. They were ascending and descending and may have been confined. The application of these data to Tunguska are debatable, but there's one very curious association. My transit line, which is supposed to be a scribble, remember, shows a remarkable similarity to the satellite photo of the region. This leads me to believe this session might be talking about viewing Tunguska from the sky. Like my first session was about observations from the ground, the second one is from the sky or from outer space. <laughs> How interesting! So there's my answer to the question, do my sessions discuss the Tunguska event? Now moving on, let's consider those explosion theories again. Was it a meteoric impact? Or an exploding meteor? Or an extraterrestrial spaceship? Or antimatter? Which of any of these four theories fit my session data? Let's start off by stating what we know. There was no meteoric remains ever found at the site. So that means we can rule out the first and second theories. However, the antimatter theory and the ET theory, they seem to play together because there's no such thing as free floating antimatter in space, since it would just self annihilate. So if antimatter were involved, some sort of extraterrestrial intelligence would also have to be involved. And that is what my second session seems to be talking about. Crossing some sort of threshold. Emerging. Intercepting a megalith. Scattering it with good sense creating an ostentatious display by casting it down. These data paint a curious and puzzling picture. Like maybe ETs needed to dispose of a potentially dangerous free-floating laboratory, possibly built or staged on a large piece of space rock. People on the ground saw this thing streaming across the sky for 10 minutes, so they clearly saw something burning up in our atmosphere. This brings back the meteoric theories again. So let's put all this together. It looks like ETs found a location of sparse population on Earth, then carefully maneuvered a dangerous mass like a large piece of space rock, a meteor, to that location, then let the antimatter self-annihilate. Which brings up an interesting question. If you were an ET, why wouldn't you just explode the antimatter in space? Why explode it near Earth? Maybe it had something to do with the shockwave involved. Perhaps the Earth acted like a shock absorber for the blast, which, if occurred in outer space, may have been far more disastrous, especially if you consider space as being occupied by multiple ET cultures. So it seems like my session data supports three theories here, all tied together. It was a meteoric mass that exploded under ET control and possibly involved antimatter or other highly exotic explosive technologies. And with that, I thank you for watching.